So welcome everyone. My name's Hannah Carter. I'm the CEO of OGS. We are a plant-based egg business based here in the UK. Um, I've been asked to talk today a little bit about uh, the sustainability within the baking industry. And there's a number of areas that I'm going to cover off today that are much more macro than we might traditionally have spoken about at an event like this. Um, I think it's really important to put in context when we're talking about sustainability and why it's so important, because fundamentally, I think a lot of the conversations that are happening are around the sort of types of animal products that we can see when we look about sustainability. It's looking at the sustainability of the factory itself, etc. But actually, why is this so important? Because when we start to look at how we fit in with um, humans and animals and the planet, why is it so important that we reduce our reliance on animal products? Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how that's actually going to impact how we uh, can move around as individuals and the lives that we lead today, if we look at COVID as an example. And so then I'm going to move on to looking at our reduction of the use of egg. Egg has been one of those products within the baking industry and certainly across the board, which we haven't really looked at as an area to reduce our sustainability um, and share with you a bit of context about where that sits within baked goods, cakes, et cetera, and its relative over-indexing with its contribution to uh, carbon footprint, for example. And then I'm going to move on to look at um, us as OGS, um, Aquafaba, as a plant alternative to talk a little bit as one example. I'm sure you'll hear of many other examples of how we can reduce egg um, through the course of this whole conference, but share with you a little bit about OGS ourselves and how we can help to contribute and support you and us as a baking industry with the first two points above. So this might seem extreme to be saying that if we don't reduce the use of animals within our supply chain, it can reduce, how, it can change how we live today. But unfortunately, this is the sad truth. So a little bit of context for you. The World Health Organization um, has developed something called One Health. And traditionally, we have looked at the environment i.e. the planet and, and the impact that humans might have on it. But as, as one piece, we've looked at animals and their well-being, their health um, and the biodiversity within the groups that they live in and humans. But we've seen them as three separate entities. So we try and ensure that we optimise animal health and animal welfare. We try and ensure that we optimise the planet and we try and ensure that humans are healthy. But what we haven't looked at before is the interdependency. And what we're realising is that the human activities are causing stresses in our ecosystem, which is driving disease. And in driving that disease, if we don't change how we are using animals and the environment, it's going to fundamentally impact the sustainability of humans and our freedom of movement. So what the World Health Organization is looking at with One Health is to say, OK, actually, let's look at these ecosystems as One Health and look at how if we have healthy animals, we have a healthy environment, which means we have healthy humans. Um, and that cycle obviously continues. And so what does that mean when we look at stresses and activities and much of this that you will have seen before, but some of it? You might not have considered. So obviously we're looking at urbanisation. So as we as we continue to grow our cities, we're constantly impacting on the biodiversity within those areas. That in turn impacts on habitats and we start to encroach on these wild areas. We all know about the felling of rainforests for palm oil, for example. And Whilst on the one hand, we do we we think that it's so far away from us as the baking industry, what I'm going to share with you and loop back in is why it's so important that we start to pay attention ourselves too. And it's not something that's happening far away. We know about climate change and we know about the sort of extractive industries and we understand the connectivity between those. But perhaps what we haven't thought about before is that actually the way in which we farm animals and the way in which we use animals fundamentally impacts the growth of disease within humans. So our intensive farming and heavy reliance on animal products is actually driving disease. You may be shocked to know that actually over 60% of the existing, existing diseases are actually from animals. And the thing that's scary is that this is getting worse. The emergence of human infectious diseases from animals is growing. And it's growing because we are now 10 billion people. Our 10th billion person was born at the beginning of this year. And we are starting to live in closer and closer proximity. We are also looking and demanding cheaper food and lower welfare standards are happening in other countries outside of the UK, for example. And when we start to put that pressure and reliance on animal agricultural farming, the 
the welfare goes low. And when the welfare goes low, the disease rates go up within the animals. During COVID-19, what most of us don't know is that out in Russia in 2021, there was a huge outbreak of avian flu and 150 people died of avian flu. But because it was COVID, nobody knew. But COVID and SARS are all diseases that came from agricultural farming of some kind. And so whether you care about the planet, whether you care about animals or not, if the only thing you care about is our own human sustainability, we have products. So what does this mean? What can we do about this in the baking industry? And that sounds very big, Hannah, and something that our governments need to be worrying about. But what can we actually do about? And the reality is that the choices that we make within this baking industry hugely contributes to the reduction in our reliance on the types of products that we use. And we talk a lot about reducing animal products. And I think the reality is, is that actually we talk we talk about the products that you can see we talk about the sausages and having meat free mondays we talk about swapping out you know cow's milk for oat milk we talk about having your plant burger instead of your normal burger but what most of us don't don't look at certainly when we do our own shopping is the hidden animals within our food chain the milk powder in a packet of crisps, the barn egg in that Starbucks muffin. Now, you and I will know about the barn egg in the Starbucks muffin, but most consumers don't. And so much of this animal based um, product is hidden under that surface. You know, just as an example, all of these products contain animal products and yet none of it is there for nutritional content. Sugar, for those who don't know, many sugars whitened using bones from animals to make it white. The milk powder in the crisp, the egg white in the gluten-free bread, the gelatin in the Haribo and the beetles in that red food colouring. These are all areas where, quite frankly, you know, we're not going to wait for my dad, who's 75, to make a change and start to care about the planet. He doesn't. But he also doesn't care if there's animal product in here or not. So by removing it, it's not going to make a difference to him so long as it tastes delicious. So how do we as a baking industry start to look at the way in which we design products and we start to look at what is within these products? Because within baking, everyone is eating cake because it's delicious. No one is eating it for the nutritional content in the protein of the egg or the calcium in that butter. That is not why they're eating those products. And so actually, if we as a baking industry can start to think a little bit differently and understand how and what types of animal products we use and start to reduce our reliance on it. Because let's face it, most of us have to use barn eggs, for example, or at least cage eggs, where the animals are intensively farmed together, the disease grows, we now have avian flu, and we know the challenges we're facing. It's been here since 1997. We still don't have a vaccine for it. It's mutating every single year. It's not going away. And we have the challenge that we now face today where we can't get hold of supply. The price of grain's gone up, you know, and all the other diseases like salmonella that come with eggs. So how can we reduce that reliance? And it's time surely for us as a baking industry to move on. You know, the reality is the pancake was developed in 1100 A.D. Waffles, fruitcakes, brioches, brownies, to name but a few. All of these recipes are hundreds of years old. And as fantastic as that might be, and we think we don't want to change this heritage, it's absolutely fantastic that they are this old. I'm really grateful that as humans, we've actually evolved because there was a time when we when we had germ theory, where people thought germs came from smells. So surgeons were chopping people's legs off and they were not washing the implements that they used, for example, and kept reusing them and disease kept spreading. But at some point we had a new idea and we had and we had new insight and we started to change the way that we do things. An extreme example, you might say. However, the reality is, is that if we don't reduce our alliance, that we're going to have a problem. So how do we as an industry Instead of doing what we've always done, how do we start to create products of the future and develop the current products that we have here today that reduce the reliance? Eggs is an area that we sit on and OGS was set up and founded fundamentally to remove hidden animals from the supply chain. So this next part really is focused on eggs specifically. And many people don't realise that eggs is actually up there as the number eight biggest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. 
we know about the beef, we know about the meat, but milk is further down. So when we're starting to choose within our within the baking industry where we want to tackle and reduce and have a more sustainable future, many of us have been looking at packaging. Well, that's fantastic. But on your wheel of 100 percent contribution of carbon emissions, 8 percent is packaging. And when we look at manufacturing and production, roughly 20 um, percent of that comes from the um comes from the infrastructure itself. The rest comes from ingredient. And when we start to look at the contribution of eggs, you realise how huge it is. Let's take a sponge cake. In your standard sponge cake, pretty much most Victoria sponges, most lemon drizzle cakes on a retailer's shelves or, or in a bakery somewhere has 20% of egg as an ingredient contribution. But the carbon emissions of that cake of the egg is 60%. It's hugely over-indexing and taking a huge proportion of that. So whilst it's fantastic that we're focused on these electric cars and they're putting, you know, renewable um, renewable energy into the factory, we shouldn't not do that. Actually, if money and budget and time is tight, the place to have the biggest impact is here in the egg. I've talked a little bit about the the challenges with the egg industry as well. I'm not going to labour on this actually because I think we're all we're all experiencing that pain at the moment. But not only is egg from a sustainability perspective challenging, it's now becoming hugely challenging and it's not going away when it comes to getting consistent supply. And you will know those those farmers that have now gone out of business because of this crisis because it's not tenable anymore. So we need another solution. All sounds great, Hannah, but the reality is. Our customers want to reduce our costs. They want calorie reduction. We know the major retailers are very focused on calorie and fat reduction. We need to reduce our carbon footprint, reduce the sugar if we can, and we need consistent supply. This sounds almost like something that's impossible to do and maintain all of these things at the same time. And actually, it isn't impossible. And I'm going to now move on to share a little bit about how Orgs Aquafaba can help relieve many of these challenges that we face. And this is one option. There will be many that you hear about, uh, you know, as we go through this conference together. But hopefully this gives you some inspiration and, and some ideas that you can take back to your MPD teams um, to start to look at how you reformulate your products. Very brief bit about Orgs. Our mission is to remove hidden egg from the supply chain. Anywhere where it is, is there for function only and not nutrition. And so, like I said, if we can develop amazing brownies that don't have egg in, my dad doesn't care. It's going to be a delicious brownie. So we're here to provide a solution to manufacturers. Um, we are the only company globally that has a patent on our product um, and the only company globally that makes aquafaba at scale in thousands, uh, thousand litres and ten litres. So it's been designed with manufacturing in mind. Just some context, we're also the largest plant-based bakery brand here in the UK, and so our aquafaba has been used to establish this brand. Um, and we're now moving into the space where we're able to provide the baking industry with this as a product uh, to, enhance, um, to enhance your products and meet the needs of your customers too. What is aquafaba? Well, fundamentally, it's chickpea water. And um, whilst technically uh, you might be able to drain it, drain a can of chickpeas, um, depending on how long the chickpeas have been in there for uh, and the grade of chickpeas, the quality of that aquafaba is different and the chemical composition is different. But also, most importantly, I'm not sure your technical team or your floor managers are going to be very happy for draining cans of chickpeas. So somebody needed to create this at scale, and that was us here at Oggs. So we worked with two universities to understand what is the optimal chemical composition of an aquafaba to allow it to have as broad a usage as possible but with as little, if any, um, flavour profile. Because what many of you will find who started to move into the plant-based space, many of the plant-based alternatives have a very strong flavour profile. And quite frankly, nobody wants their Victoria sponge tasting of a chickpea. So um, ensuring that that flavour profile was neutral was also really important. So what can you use aquafaba for? Some of you have heard of it, some of you haven't. Well, mousses, meringues and foams, anything where you want to create that lightness, that structure, um, brownies, cookies, um, cakes. We've been doing some phenomenal work across the retailers with own label on, on, on working on their products, batters and Yorkshire puddings and also glazes. Glazes is a really interesting one. You know, if you look at um, 
croissants, for example, or pan au chocolat, you know, roughly one to two percent of that is egg on the top. And when you remove that egg, you're disproportionately removing calories and fat of three or four percent calorie reduction when you take that glaze out. Because but for that glaze, this product would be egg free. So. So again, how can we start to find those nudges and those small changes within the within our supply chain where it only makes it shiny? There's no other reason why it's there for a glaze. So how can we find a, a more sustainable solution that's going to release uh, relieve that pressure on the supply chain? Um, just some visuals for you to see here of some of the products that we make with across the the. Uh, food service industry as well. Uh, it's only recently that we've had our thousand of our uh, Palacon sizing, but fundamentally, you know, wherever there's egg, there's opportunity to have ox. Um, but, you know, it all sounds great, Hannah, excellent. L I like all of that um, information on what it can do, but what else are you going to bring me? Um, from a health perspective, we have zero fat, 85% less calories and a 90% reduction in salt. So if you did a blend of egg and og, for example, which we're doing as well to limit any changes in the in the supply chain. So literally reduce your egg by 20%, add in 20% aquafaba. Um, in a in a standard cake, for example, you have an 11% reduction in calories and fats simply by swapping out the egg for og. Because again, that egg is disproportionately contributing to the fats that are in that cake. From a sustainability standpoint, egg for og, we have 72% less carbon emissions than a traditional egg. So when you, if you think about that pie chart where we looked at 60%, if you can start to reduce that egg down by 10, 20% from where it currently is today, we're starting to cut in to that carbon emissions by 20, 30%. Um, which is going to be significantly higher than your solar panels on the roof of the factory. But what about quality? This is fundamental too. What's really fascinating, I'm not going to lie, when I started this company, I had no idea this was going to be the case. But what we're finding is that because egg is an emulsifier and it traps those flavours, when you take the egg down, but you maintain that lightness and structure, um, we're getting better flavour. So the chocolate's more chocolatey, the lemon is more lemony. Um, we're finding that we're getting a much uh, a lighter texture and a much softer crumb in a cake, for example. And we've managed to extend shelf life by up to 50% on base muffins, on small mini muffins, which small products are really hard to have a long shelf life on anyway. But because of that balance um, of the of the moisture that's coming through, um, we're able, we've, we've gone up to sort of from 28 days to 42 days on some key products. And finally, from a cost effectiveness standpoint, you know, this is always the big question, yeah, but what does it cost? We're pretty much head to head now for the price of free range eggs. But even if you're still using the barn eggs or the caged eggs, there's still a 50p difference, let's be honest, per litre. But actually, because you can reduce those overall, uh, because you're getting an improvement in the flavour, you can actually start to reduce other really expensive ingredients, for example, the cocoa. Um, and so if you're reducing that cocoa down, and especially anyone who's using fair trade cocoa, you can take the sugars down because the whole cake is much sweeter. And because of that shelf life extension um, that you're getting, you're reducing wastage. The aquifer was also ambient. So you're reducing any wastage going through that you might have with the egg. And the shelf life gives you that greater factory efficiencies. So all in all, why would you not swap egg fog? And the results that we're seeing from the from the major bakeries that we're working with today have been exceptional. So just a summary from our side, whips and foams and create structure, less calories, less fat, and also allergen free. Uh, this is just an example if you remove 500 tonnes of egg out of your supply chain, that's 356 million grams of fat. Um, that's the equivalent to 39 million Mars bars. So for any of the major bakeries on the line, if you start to look at even just doing a blend, reducing by five or 10 percent of egg in your factory, the contribution you can be making to the retailers on their fat reduction, their calorie reduction, their carbon reduction um, is significant when you start to level it all up together. So extend shelf life, reduce calories also chicken friendly, which for us is, is fundamental our area. So forgive the slight order there, but just as a summary, the choices we will make as a bakery industry 
is going to make a difference. We can positively contribute to the hu to the future of the of planet and human sustainability. Let's rethink how we bake and remove the function based animal products from the supply chain. You know, the ones that don't need to be there. It does require new thinking. It does require true innovation. But it's something that we are responsible for because whatever we put on people's shelves is what people are going to choose to eat. And finally, you can replace eggs for OGS and make improvements in overall product health, quality and sustainability. That's it from me. Thank you very much. And I think we've got a Q&A now. So thank you. Thank you so much, Hannah, for such a thought provoking session at Bakery Live. Do you think people have preconceived notions about plant based bakery? And has there been some challenge for you in the sense of convincing people that this is something that that works and that they will enjoy? Um, yeah, it's a great question, actually. I think for us as a brand, we have never been overtly vegan and plant based. Um, the challenge that you have within uh, cake is people do think, I mean, you take the egg out and it becomes a dry, dense cake. So the history of, pe of the people, if anyone who has tried a vegan cake or a plant based cake is that it's dry and dense. So I think what's really important is um, for us to focus on ensuring that it is as good as all the other cakes on the shelf that happens to be plant based as opposed to the lead being plant based. And that's certainly the stance that we take as a brand. And so any any larger bakeries that we start to work with from an ingredients perspective, you know, um, it's it's about being sustainable and to do that, you have to be plant based as opposed to focusing on being plant based, um, because there's definitely preconceived ideas in uh, around. Is this going to taste delicious or not? Um, or is it going to be dry and dense? So I think the positioning of that is really important. Um, and as I say, for us as a brand, we focus on being an ethical and sustainable brand. And to do that, that means we're plant based. That That's really interesting because it sounds like um, your approach certainly is about presenting a product that just happens to be with these other products because you're talking about vegan plant-based being a signifier and an indicator to people um when when you know we talk about plant-based bakery um and when certainly when you're in conversations with manufacturers would you, would you say they're open-minded to trying these alternative ingredients or do you think there's an element of fam a familiarity in what they know works? Yeah, probably both. Um, I realise that hasn't quite answered the question, but I think, of course, we know what we like, we know what's comfortable. And also I think bakery is very different to many of the other plant-based industries because there's so much chemistry involved in baking. It's so complex. You just change the baking powder and the whole outcome of the bake changes. So it's a lot harder to just say, you know, in a chicken pie, swap the chicken out for a plant based chicken. Nothing changes, particularly you might have some moisture issues, whereas in baking, fundamentally, it's I think the the challenge comes in the, the fact that it's a complete redesign if you're going to go plant based versus um, totally plant based versus a sort of a one in one out on a base recipe, which is very much why we focus on um, a reduction and a blend. So and, and the team starting to get used to these new products. So, you know, don't necessarily strip egg out completely immediately. Um, but how can we make a change from a perspective of just make that reduction? And I think the other thing is it's really key too is you know these huge bakeries, the efficiencies that they run at. So you make a change to a recipe and a change to a process. The cost to implement that change is is astronomical, and the efficiencies and running the line and trials and tests, et cetera, is huge. So if we're going to start to look at plant-based and we're going to start to reduce egg, for example, our focus anyway is how can we take as much egg out as possible without changing anything else in the process? So, but because if we took 20% of egg out of the whole of the bakery industry, 
that would have a much bigger impact than taking 100 percent out of egg out of 20 percent of the industry for example actually that numbers works out about right but you know what i mean you know where i'm going so i think it's there's a blend of of sort of this is how i've always done it and this is what makes it delicious i've had bad experiences in the past as our previous question um and it's hugely challenging and not as simple as everyone else in the other parts of the industry seem to seem to make it um so i think that's why for us certainly partnering really closely giving lots of guidance lots of support and lots of advice to those npd teams is going to be critical to drive that change absolutely and i and i see that that message in your presentation and what what you're doing at ogs about not necessarily undergoing this massive change, um, but making small changes at work. I mean, when you were talking about the precision of bakery, it I was thinking about my experience of home baking. Yeah. And you think, oh, maybe I'll just do a little bit. And then the whole thing goes kaput. Yeah, you can. And that's really challenging. Um, just finally, what made you decide to um, go with this bigger picture view? I mean, you spoke about disease spread at the start of your presentation, which I was really struck by, because it's certainly not something that's as commonly in dialogue as climate change and animal welfare. I think to the point on the One one Health, which sort of I was trying to communicate, is that um, we can't ignore that. And we have all experienced COVID. And the reality is, if we don't reduce the reliance, well, we we will be in another COVID. We will be in other lockdowns. And so I certainly wasn't aware of that until recently. And therefore, the compelling reason to change isn't about growing market share necessarily all the time. It isn't about giving someone a cheaper product. The compelling reason to change is also about actual long-term stability and freedom of movement of who we are today. And the bakery industry and the people making the decisions what goes in those products are the ones who have control over what can or can't change in the future. And so as dramatic as or drastic as it sounds, even though it's true, it feels really important to also bring that context in because I think sometimes sometimes some of us are making changes because we care ethically and some of us make changes because it's just really good business sense you know because some there's a whole group of consumers who care about the environment and there's a whole group that don't so whether they do or whether they don't we still have to change if as human beings we want to live in the free way that we've lived before and not be told when we can and can't go out and what we can and can't do that's just an angle that I don't think is talked about anywhere and would certainly shock most of us into thinking maybe at least twice before we say before we say no or before we give up. Yeah, I, th- I think that's a really poignant point to end on. Um, I think it can be easy to, to look at it in a very through a very small lens. And actually, by having this bigger picture view, it it's 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 incentivizing. I mean, I'm 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 listening to you, and I'm thinking, oh gosh, maybe I should, you know, take take these steps to 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 reduce my impact. So, thank you so much, Hannah, for a really thought provoking session and for taking the time to speak with me at Bakery Live. No worries. Thanks for having me.